Welcome back to Imagining a Just World Order. If you were here last week, uh, you know that all the material we put out about how hopeful this series is about solving problems. In fact, we didn't solve too many last week, but we spelled out exactly what they were, and that was useful. Um, we partner for uh, this winter lecture series with the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church, who's actually the main sponsor, and Holly, Osher Lifelong Learning, and of course we are supported by Humanities Nebraska, and we owe them a great debt because they have been doing it for well on to 25 or 30 years. Um, those of you who are new or haven't been around for a while know that, um, or should know, that our pattern today will be, our lecturer will lecture for around an hour, and then we'll take a break for 10 or 15 minutes, uh, going into the other room, getting snacks and so forth, and then resume for Q&A after. A couple of things about that. First of all, um, you uh, are uh, forbidden, it's a new edict that the Unitarians endorse for, from bringing cups back into this. Um, because we used to chase after them, and we're not doing that anymore. And also, uh, there are donations um, baskets on each of the two tables where there are snacks, and um, the donations that you give in those baskets help to support the winter lecture series. They do not pay for the food. The food is uh, essentially donated. You know that we have a uh, five lecture series followed by a panel discussion. But I must tell you that the final lecture is um, somewhat, um, well, we have a different speaker. Uh, I suspect that you were looking forward to hearing Don Wilhite, who has been a great friend of the Winter Lecture Series over the years and was responsible, actually, for our getting into Harden Hall about five years ago when we did the series on climate change and had to move out of this church because of renovations. Anyway, um, Don can't make it uh, next week, but uh, was good enough, knowing that this might happen, to arrange for a substitute. The substitute is Mike Hayes, who's a professor of, uh, uh, in the School of Natural Resources, a fellow of the Drought Mitigation Center, and also a fellow of the Dougherty Water for Food Institute. And um, uh, Don, I'm sorry, Mike, has also participated in previous winter lecture series, was one of the lecturers when we were at Harden Hall about four or five years ago. So I'm sure you won't be disappointed. And Mike told me that uh, the description that we wrote for, that we and Don wrote for a Don Wilhite's talk, will fit what he's going to say precisely. And so I remind you that the topic next week is sustainable development environmental stressors and resilience, and it's going to emphasize um, how we can achieve responsible economic growth in the context of a world that's experiencing a, both a drought and climate change and all the food shortage and potential conflicts that that entails. Today's lecture is going to be, lecturer is going to be introduced by uh, Shevet Sait, who is our treasurer and the only member of our committee with a new car. <laughs> I, I think Dick is learning to not speak full truth. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased that my name is Sharsik, as Dick mentioned. I'm member of the committee. Uh, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today. Uh, just by way of introduction, the internet is increasingly intrudes our lives for good or for bad. On the good side, <coughs> recall that during the Arab Spring, the online networks were crucial in organizing a core group of activists in Egypt. And we have many, many examples of the internet being used uh, or adopted to improve education, health, and political processes. On the bad side, 
we heard a surprising admission recently on the radio by Vince Cerf, the inventor of the internet, who said that all that dark stuff never crossed my, his mind. So they didn't even think about what the bad things can happen to the internet when they were trying to set it up. We also have the headlines in recent years that captured the abuse of the internet, the trolling by the internet research agency, the Stuxnet, malware to sabotage the uranium enrichment facility in Iran, the WannaCry cyber attack last year by North Korea that severely damaged the healthcare systems in Britain and elsewhere, and so on. In the future, we hear about the Internet of Things, <coughs> and when it's being implemented with, without adequate attention to the security, and so it's likely that we will have even more vulnerabilities in the future with cyber attacks in our daily lives. Our speaker today is particularly well qualified to talk about the cyber sensitivities that threaten the world order. Justin, also known as Gus Herzwitz, is a, an associate assistant professor of law and co-director of the Space Cyber and Telecom Law Program at the University of Nebraska College of Law. He, was a, he has a law degree from the University of Chicago and economics degree from George Mason University and was a computer scientist before becoming a lawyer. His work builds on his background in these three fields to consider the interface between law and technology and the role of regulation in high-tech industries. He has a particular expertise in telecommunications law and technology, including data and cybersecurity. His work has appeared in various scholarly journals and he's been cited by the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, US Senators, FCC Commissioners, and he was recognized as a cyber security and data privacy trailblazer by the National Law Journal. He has testified before Congress, participated in roundtable discussions hosted by the FCC, and his work has been presented to the United States Army's Seven Signal Command and various international regulatory agencies. He previously taught the law schools at George Mason University and the University of Pennsylvania before moving to the University of Nebraska. He was a trial attorney with the Department of Justice and Antitrust Division and a researcher in a computer and computational sciences section at Los Alamos National Lab. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you for the uh, warm introduction, and it is a great pleasure to be here and to be a part of this series. Um, it sounds like it is a great series, and I am very pleased to hear that uh, perhaps last week you were scared and alarmed instead of <laughs> having your fear uh, swaged. Um, I considered starting, and I will now start by saying my name is Gus, and I'm here to tell you why the internet is scary. Um, but I'm not just going to tell you that it is scary, I'm going to tell you a bit about why it is scary, a bit about the challenges that we face um, and the historical development of the internet to bring us to the modern day um, and many of the concerns that uh, we uh, just heard about in the introduction. And perhaps I will try to end on an optimistic note. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start by talking about some of the uh, foundations of the internet. Um, the foundation of trust that defined the early development of the internet, the foundation of optimism that pervaded uh, the sensibilities of those who were working on the internet uh, in the early days, and the foundation of non-liability, um, which really governed uh, in the early days uh, the applications and the architecture that were being developed to run all these applications and to bring people together. So the foundation of trust. The internet was an experiment. It was not supposed to work. So in the 1960s, um, computer scientists were starting to work on the first computers and you had all these really large computers. They were uh, supercomputers, mainframes. They were things that would fill this room or this building. 
and researchers were trying to find ways to allow multiple people to share them. So that you could have multiple people using them at once, or you could interconnect computers at multiple research facilities around the country together to allow researchers to solve larger problems or collaborate to, with each other. At the time, the way that you would connect these computers together was using the telephone network, so-called circuit switch telephones. Now, circuit switch telephones are really, really great for one-to-one -one communications. I want to pick up the phone and call my mother and have a 30-minute conversation with her. That's not how you use computers. More importantly, that's not how the dozens of applications, <laughs> dozens of users running on any single computer are going to interact with other computers. When you get online, when you go to a website, when you go to, say, Facebook.com, your computer is going to be establishing uh, 10, 20, dozens of really short, bursty connections, sometimes with the uh, same web server, sometimes with other web servers, sometimes with other applications. You can't do that over a single dedicated circuit. So researchers started to develop this technology called packet switching. The idea of packet switching is instead of having one phone call, one communications channel for each bit of communications that uh, you're going to have with your computers, you have one dedicated circuit that you can put lots of different communications over. So with a phone call, I want to call my mother, I call her. If my brother wants to call my mother, he needs to call her, we need two telephone lines. With a packet, we call from our house to her house and we both are able to break our conversation into, we call them packets, little chunks, and we put those packets all on the same line, and at the other side, they're reconstructed, and you can figure out what the two conversations uh, going on were. Now, this was a revolutionary idea in the 1960s, and when I say revolutionary, it wasn't supposed to work. The general consensus was this was too complicated. There was too much overhead. You wouldn't uh, be able to computationally deal with dropped packets, lost packets, what happens if two people are trying to send information at once. Um, so uh, the old engineers said, well, you think it's impossible? We'll show you that this is going to work. And they developed this thing called the internet. And it worked. It worked really, really, really well. It worked so well that before they knew what was happening, lots of other researchers were starting to use it. Earliest applications of the internet, email, and transferring files between computers. Once you have the ability to use these applications, researchers said, you can't turn this off. You have to keep improving it, you have to keep making it better, but you can't turn it off. Um, so this really gave us the most important foundation of the internet, this idea that it works well enough, and we have to keep improving it, but it really was an accident. It wasn't a whole, there was no completely formed, completely baked idea for what the internet was supposed to be. So all of the problems that we're facing today with the internet really are the result of the fact that it wasn't supposed to work. The technology was supposed to be developed, and then once we understood that packet switching was possible, we built something that was a comprehensive, complete, well-thought-out, well-designed network on top of it. Um, but that's not what happened. Instead, we got this group of engineers um, who were dedicated to improving the technology, seeing what they could do, seeing how well they could make it work, uh, finding ways to address problems as they came up. So it was very much an ad hoc process. At the same time that uh, this ad hoc process was going on, um, other engineers, other researchers, were starting to use the uh, network to develop other applications that ran on top of it. So you had lots of researchers working in parallel to develop all these new technologies, left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, unclear if you need the network to do something but it doesn't, do you call the network guys and say, hey, you need to make the network do this, or do you address this problem on, at the application level? Do you say, okay, I'm going to assume the network can't do this, so I'm going to find a way to write code to make that work. The general consensus, the general approach um, that ultimately was given the name of the end-to-end -end principle was we don't rely on the network to do anything except provide some minimal level of communications. If you want security, if you want cool features, if you want uh, redundancy, if you want performance, you need to find ways at the application layer to make that happen. So, this group of researchers all knew each other. 
everyone working on the internet through most of the 1980s, you could count not on one hand, but you could count in the thousands. Um, you could uh, meet most of the senior people by going to conferences. If you knew that someone at Stanford was doing something interesting and you didn't know who they were, you could call up a friend at Stanford and pretty quickly find out who they were. If you uh, uh, found out that someone at, at MIT had done something that was breaking your computers or your applications or just creating problems, you could call someone up and find out who was doing this thing and you could call up their boss and tell them, you have to make this guy stop what he's doing. If someone uh, decided, you know what, I'm going to be mischievous and I'm going to write some code that can actually do harm, the community as a whole could ostracize this individual. The community had a common set of values, a common set of goals and principles. Um, they were small enough that they could uh, uh, rely on offline, in real life recourse if someone was doing bad things. There could be social sanctions, political, uh, um, uh, professional sanctions for bad actors. Um, that's a very different world than the world that we have today with the internet. It's one where, as I say, a foundation of trust is sufficient. I trust that my colleagues aren't going to break the system. I trust that people are only going to use this new network for good. As we heard, Vint Cerf, one of the uh, individuals who has a claim to the, the title the, the father of the internet, one of the about dozen individuals who can really, we can really say the internet would not exist if not for him. As we heard, he wasn't thinking someone might use this for bad at the time. He was thinking, how can we make this really awesome thing better? So this gives us the foundation of optimism. Um, and uh, the title of the lecture series is Imagining a Just World Order. Uh, I want to start with uh, uh, a bit of a passage from the Declaration of, Internet, of Independence of Cyberspace. This is a document that was uh, written by uh, um, uh, recently passed away, uh, founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, many know him better for his role in The Grateful Dead, John Perry Barlow. Um, he somewhat ironically wrote this uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, so not exactly a uh, uh, location that one thinks of um, uh, kind of a socialistic vision of happiness and world unity. Um, but uh, his description of the governance of the internet. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. We have no elected government, nor are we likely to have one, so I address you with no greater authority than that with which liberty itself always speaks, I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose upon us. Cyberspace consists of transactions, relationships, and thought itself arrayed like a standing wave in the web of our communications. Ours, ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, but it is not where bodies live. We are creating a world that all may enter without privilege or prejudice accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. He continues, your increasingly obsolete information industries would perpetuate themselves by proposing laws. He wrote this shortly before the 1996 Telecommunications Act was adopted in the United States. Laws that claim to own speech itself throughout the world. These laws would declare ideas to be another industrial product no more noble than pig iron. These increasingly hostile and colonial measures place us in the same position as those previous lovers of freedom and self-determination who had to reject the authorities of distant, uninformed powers. This is the Declaration of Cyberspace Independence, so uh, the, the authors of the Declaration of Independence he's invoking. We must declare our virtual selves immune from your sovereignty, even as we continue to consent to your rule over our bodies, we will spread ourselves across the planet so that no one can arrest our thoughts. We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before. So this was the vision of uh, a very prominent internet activist at the time, but it wasn't just the 
prominent internet, I mean, very, you could say, fringe thinkers based on reading this. Um, I want to show an advertisement from the exact opposite of what you might think uh, John Perry Barlow represents. Uh, if we can uh, have an audio. <laughs> You might remember MCI used to be a, a prominent telecommunications country. Um, you might also remember WorldCom, and uh, if you're thinking WorldCom, you might remember Enron as well. Uh, certainly the opposite end of the political spectrum from uh, uh, John Perry Barlow. Um, but this was the ethos. This was the idea of the internet in the early 1990s, and it was coming on the wave of optimism and really trust-based communities uh, that had driven the internet to technological success and prominence uh, through the 1980s. Um, so this was the vision of the time. Um, John Perry Barlow, he wrote, as I said, his Declaration of Independence uh, for Cyberspace in response to the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which the United States Congress was uh, debating at the time. Um, in that act, Congress included two very important provisions, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act and Section 223 of the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act was a response in good faith uh, from Congress to the internet engineers of the 1980s who said, look, we're building this great thing. We've got no idea what's going to happen with it. We've got no idea how people are going to use it, but it's going to be great. And you know that it's going to be great. And for those of you who are more pragmatic, you know that it's going to be a really important economic force and we want the United States to control it and we don't want Europe to build this. We'll come back to that idea uh, in a moment. Um, if you quit legal liability on these new companies that are starting to use the internet to build really great things, they're not going to invest because the uncertainties are too great. So you need to give them some protection. And Congress gave them protection. Um, Section 230C1, no provider or user of an interactive computer service, that is the internet basically, uh, shall be uh, treated uh, as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. That's a user. What does this mean? This basically means that internet companies, the uh, Facebooks, the Googles, uh, the, uh, I guess some, I can't say Yahoo anymore, the Yahoos of the world, all of these companies, if their users use the platforms that they're creating for evil, the companies themselves cannot be held liable for it. And it goes actually further than that. It says the companies are under no obligation to police their users. If your users, if you know your users are engaged in problematic behavior, we're going to rely on social sanctions, we're going to rely on the idea that maybe those users will face legal consequences. We're not going to punish Facebook when one of their users posts something illegal via Facebook. Um, very powerful statute. Now, this was uh, supposed to be paired, and actually it was paired um, in the uh, Telecommunications Act uh, with Section 223. Um, this was a quid pro quo. Section 223 said this doesn't apply to obscene material, that is pornography that is accessible to children. So there was a quid pro quo that was struck here. Uh, internet companies, you're going to keep the internet clean from pornography for children, and in exchange for that, we're not going to hold you liable uh, Hold you liable when adults do bad stuff online. Now, a couple years later, the Supreme Court looked at uh, Section 223 and said, there's a problem with this. It violates the First Amendment. 
we aren't going to allow Congress to uh, regulate speech that's primarily a speech form that's primarily intended for adults, the internet, in a way that's going to make it child safe. So uh, Congress, uh, uh, the Supreme Court threw out Section 223 but allowed Section 230 to stand. Um, so there's a very broad immunity for companies developing uh, content online. There's another uh, aspect of uh, this immunity. Uh, courts since the 1980s have declined to treat software as a product. Why is that important? Well, there's an area of law known as products liability law. Products liability law uh, does a couple of things. Under products liability law, if you're the manufacturer of a product, you can't contractually in, uh, 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 seek indemnification. So if I sell table saws, I can't have a contractual provision uh, when I sell the table saw that says, if you use this table saw and it malfunctions and it severely injures you, you agree not to hold me liable. Products liability law says those uh, provisions are null and void. The second thing that products liability law says um, is this is a form of strict liability. If you're the manufacturer of a defective product or a poorly designed product and it causes harm, the consumer doesn't need to go to court and prove that there was a defect. The, there isn't a defense that the uh, consumer, the user of the product, was misusing the product or had damaged it or failed to inspect it. Rather, if you're the manufacturer of a product, something goes wrong, you agree to compensate the consumer for that harm. Now, courts said software is not a product. Instead, and this comes from the idea in the 1980s, if you were buying software, you were probably a company going to a, a software developer and paying that software developer to write software for you. So this was a contracted for service. This was a bespoke product, not a mass market product like a table saw. So at the time, court said, look, we expect to have sophisticated parties engaging in contractual negotiations for software. Um, so we're not going to apply products liability law. The setting today, very different. How many people here have ever negotiated with Bill Gates over the details of your purchase of Microsoft Word? I did. <laughs> uh, the wise guy. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so state government is uh, there. You're the sophisticated party, not acting as the uh, ordinary uh, uh, consumer. Um, so. In the modern setting, software is very much like a consumer mass market product, but the law has developed on the assumption that it is not. This effectively is another form of uh, uh, non-liability for the uh, developer, the engineering side of the internet. Software developers, if you need to go to court to prove that Microsoft uh, uh, Word was negligently designed. The evidentiary burdens there, the legal costs, are so prohibitively high that you're never going to win that case. But it's OK, because you're never going to be allowed to bring that case. Because when you buy Microsoft Word, the contract says you agree that the software is uh, to hold to, uh, 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 Microsoft um, uh, not liable for any defects in the software. They let you know that there might be some defects in the software, so you can't sue them. Um, Again, if software or product, that would be different. Okay, moving on from foundations <coughs> to the evolution of uh, this technology, uh, where things went from these foundations, and I'm going to come back. Oh, you can't see the. Uh, so the, the very top there says evolution and, in quotes, technical debt. Technical debt is an important concept uh, that we'll come back to. So I've got three quotes here. Rough consensus and running code go overboard on internet features and move fast and break things. The first of these, uh, rough consensus and running code, that is a quote from uh, David Clark, another one of the individuals who you could say has a claim to having invented or being one of the, the fathers of the internet. He was the head of the internet architecture board for most of the 1980s. He's uh, still a professor at uh, MIT at the um, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. This is a statement that he made to uh, an assembly of IETF, that is Internet Engineering Task Force Engineers in 1992, to describe the process of the development of the internet through the 1980s. 
Um, it stands for the idea that we as internet engineers don't over-design in a bureaucratic way the internet. Instead, we have an informal process. Uh, the earlier part, uh, he says, we reject kings. Uh, we reject people who formally say, these are the rules for the road. Instead, we rely on rough consensus and running code. If you have an idea for a program, for a feature, a way to improve the internet, write code that makes it work and release it. And if a lot of people use it, that's rough consensus. That's the direction the technology is going to evolve. Now there's a problem with this. Are people going to robustly evaluate this software, this code that you're releasing to figure out, does it create problems? Does it have security vulnerabilities? No. They're going to say, wow, this is really cool. I've never been able to send emails this fast before. I've never been able to transfer files or never been able to uh, uh, use social media as easily as this before. Suddenly you've got 10 million people using Twitter and then suddenly you realize, oh, this is an anonymous communication platform that anyone can sign up on and use it to uh, spread information, false information, at a mass scale. Rough consensus and running code embraces that sort of result, incidentally. Um, Clark, when he made this statement, he was trying to calm a revolt amongst the IETF, the Internet Engineering Community. Um, for the last five or six years, the previous five or six years, the United States had been a party to an international effort uh, organized through the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, to develop a different network, something that would replace the internet. Um, this was a bureaucratic nightmare. It was meeting after meeting after meeting. They were doing things crazy, like thinking, let's build security in, and let's not have an anonymous platform. Instead, let's have identity built in at the ground level. Um, really technologically difficult stuff that these bureaucrats, many lawyers, thought, this is going to be really important because people are going to misuse this platform. And the IETF, primarily American engineers, they hated this approach because it was top down, it was a bunch of annoying lawyers and bureaucrats, many from international governments, saying, this is how you need to des design the technology. And these are problems that you need to solve that we don't know how to solve. Just you, you go figure it out and make it happen. Um, this was not the internet of the 1980s that had been developed primarily in the United States. Uh, that internet was a wild west. That internet was fun. That internet was, you have an idea, you just run with it and you go out and if it's cool, people sing your praises. Uh, you don't need to wear a suit and a tie. Uh, it, it was great. So 1992, uh, the IETF engineers, they were basically nearing a point of revolt against this OSI process, um, this international uh, process, and they decided we're, we're going to have none of it. So this rough consensus and running code speech, uh, Clark actually was being very critical of the American, uh, the IETF uh, engineers, saying, look, you guys are a bunch of children. We get it. We're going to work with you because you've got no choice. Um, so he saved the internet, in a sense, from a, a political crisis there. A couple years later, go overboard on internet features. 1995, this is from Bill Gates's uh, famous Internet Tidal Wave memo. This is a memo that he sent to uh, everyone at Microsoft saying, we miss the internet. Everyone is getting on board the internet. We got to get there, too. Um, prior to 1993, 1994, the internet was government controlled in the United States. Uh, there was no commercial activity allowed on the internet. Uh, the NSF net was the National Science Foundation net was the primary backbone and everyone interconnecting with it had to agree to a memorandum of understanding saying this can only be used for non-commercial research and academic purposes. Um, in 1993, they said this is going to be big. This is commercially important. So uh, uh, the government uh, went through a, a formal RFP process to establish the first uh, commercial internet exchange. Um, and they uh, uh, basically, they didn't decommission NSF, but NSF was no longer the primary internet backbone. It quickly started to commercialize. And that's when consumers uh, started to come to the internet. 
um, at scale. So Bill Gates, he told his, uh, uh, the employees of Microsoft, go overboard on internet features. You have an idea, great, do it. You want to add something to Microsoft Word, great, do it. You want to have a new uh, internet browser, do it. You want that internet browser to support flashing, blinking text that makes sounds, do it. We'll figure it all out later. Um, if it's a mess, if it doesn't work, if it's got security problems, we'll figure that out later. We're behind. We have to catch up, and the way to do this is to basically take rough consensus and running code and run with it. If you have an idea that's good enough to try and implement, implement it. If it works, we'll ship it. Um, you can. Um, you don't need to imagine. You know what happened with uh, a lot of uh, the early uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Internet products. Uh, they had some pretty substantial security problems. But we don't learn from that. Mark Zuckerberg, from the Facebook IPO letter that he uh, wrote in 2012, he explained to potential investors Facebook's internal motto. You can actually find uh, um, earlier uh, uh, statements where uh, Facebook engineers say, this is our motto, move fast and break things. What is move fast and break things? It's rough consensus and running code. It's, this is how we've always, always done it, let's try something different. We have an idea for a feature, implement it. If it doesn't work, if it breaks things, if it creates problems, we'll fix it later. You're noticing a theme, I expect. <laughs> if it's an idea, run with it. If it works, great, a lot of people will adopt it. That's how we'll get market share, that's how we'll change the world, and if it's got problems, we'll deal with it later. So this we'll deal with it later is so there's a red box around the, the word technical debt uh, uh, in the uh, title there. Um, technical debt is a concept that was given name uh, in, the, again, the early 1990s. The idea of technical debt is exactly what's being described here. The idea that uh, we're going to incur some technological debt, some set of problems that we're going to need to solve in the technology at some point later, some point in the future. So we've got great features, we've got great ideas, we want to get investors on board, we want to make sure that people use this product because if we don't reach a critical user base, a critical mass of users, we're not going anywhere. So let's re reach that critical mass of users, then we'll deal with the problems. Um, this is one of the driving principles of modern development. Uh, I'm not gonna say modern of pre-modern, of the 1980s through current era development um, uh, with internet technologies. A lot of discussion today about is this the right way to do things? And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the, the answer is obviously no, it's not the right way to do it. Um, but uh, we, we have a couple of reasons folks are uh, starting to think about this now. One is uh, legal liability. Lawyers and people generally are starting to say, you know what, when something bad happens online, we want there to be some recourse. We want there to be some protection. And yeah, we hate lawyers. I can say that, I'm a lawyer. Um, we hate lawyers, but sometimes it's good to be able to sue someone when something bad happens. And with all this immunity, with all these legal principles saying you can't do that, maybe that's a problem. Um, and uh, the engineers see that this is changing. Um, they see the writing on the wall. Um, another bigger issue from a technological perspective, this idea of technical debt, it is much, much easier to fix bugs, to address problems, to pay down this debt early on in the development process. When you start adding more and more features, once you go from a development product to a live product, a production product, to a mission critical product that you can't take down, the level of complexity, just figuring out what causes a problem is so dramatic that it's a much, much more expensive, to use the metaphor of debt, a much more expensive pay, uh, a debt to a pay down if you do it later in the process instead of early in the process. Okay, so starting to move closer to where we are today. The top, the label here is powerful attackers, powerless defenders. Uh, this is not an optimistic slide. Um, so, uh, what's the world that we live in today? Borderless.
One of the defining characters of the internet is it defies borders. There are no borders online. That's what John Perry Barlow thought was so great about the internet. It's this global network that doesn't have borders, it defies the traditional sovereigns, the traditional countries. Um, anyone can be anyone online, it's just all about thought. Um, borders are good in many ways. Without borders, we start to face a lot of really hard questions, really simple questions when we're talking about legal principles. If I do something online, what law applies? Am I in Nebraska or Iowa or Washington, D.C. or Kansas or Russia? The answer can be all of them. If I uh, send an email that contains materials that are legal in the United States, but legal in some other country, and it bounces around servers traversing the world, and it goes through some servers in countries where saying that email is illegal, arguably that country has a legal claim against me possibly a criminal claim against me. Um, the idea of borderless technology also creates really challenging questions about space and location. So uh, there's a, a case uh, before the Supreme Court right now, Microsoft v. Ireland, that uh, kind of gets into these issues. Um, if I, from my computer in Nebraska, launch an attack against the computer uh, located in uh, Washington, D.C. Where is that attack occurring? Am I in Nebraska where the attack is occurring? Is Washington, D.C. where the attack is occurring? Seems like a trivial question, perhaps, until you get uh, uh, into questions of things like self-defense. <laughs> Ordinarily, if I break into your house, you can defend yourself and take action to get me out of your house. If I'm not in your house, if I'm actually still in my house, attacking your house, can you break into my house for self-defense? Now you're not just removing me from your house, you're breaking into my house. It's a different legal principle, different legal consequences. Um, whose responsibility is it to secure a system when there aren't borders? Generally, we think I need to secure my property against uh, invaders. Well, if we don't have borders that delineate my property from the invader's property, it gets squishy, it gets more difficult to think about. Um, another aspect of no borders, it allows people to bypass the traditional information gatekeepers. So this is a, a concept that uh, we've seen very much in recent years, uh, clearly in uh, concerns about Russian misinformation campaigns, but also the changing nature of the uh, news media. Historically, if I want to get information to a wide audience, I need to go through some editorial control, be it the advertising source that I'm trying to buy ads from, be it the newspaper editor, be it the journal editors, be it uh, um, the uh, uh, author that I'm trying to convince to write a book or a story about this idea. There were gatekeepers. In this borderless world, those gatekeepers are easy to bypass. I can find ways to speak directly to a mass audience. Different world compared to uh, where we used to be. Related to this, another seemingly small but really important point. Many things that we think of as cyber attacks or internet related harms, they're nothing of the sort. They're really just attacks on social institutions that assume borders exist, that are made possible by this borderless online world. So the question then becomes, do we want to blame the internet and say the internet needs to protect us against these, or do we blame these institutions? Do we say, well, we've never been in a position where Russians are directly able to send me misinformation, so I need to think with every tweet that I see, is this a real tweet? Is it a paid for tweet? Is, a tweet, is it a tweet that's intended to confuse and misinform me? Another aspect of this world, it's what I call information sparse. So here's the famous com comment. New Yorker, uh, 1993, <laughs> on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Yeah. Possibly the most famous comic 
of the internet. It's not actually right. It's worse. On the internet, nobody knows anything about you except what you choose to tell them, and what you choose to tell them needn't be true. So on the internet, I can tell people I'm a dog. That's a much more powerful statement than no one knows that I'm a dog. I can pretend to be people other, someone other than whom I am. And again, this goes back to the engineering designs of the internet. The internet was not engineered to be an anonymous network. It was not engineered to have trust built into it or a concept of ID or name or identity. Um, edge providers, because of Section 230, they've gone the same route. They haven't built strict name technology, identity technology. When I sign up for Facebook, I can give them my name. I can give them someone else's name. Even if they have a requirement that I give them my real name, it's going to be really difficult for them to figure out if I am really who I say I am. Let's say they want me to send in a copy of my driver's license. A lot of companies have experimented things like this. How difficult would it be for me to send them a driver's license that they have no idea was fake? I'd say, uh, I'm from Canada. Facebook, have you ever seen a Canadian driver's license? No. Or I'm from uh, Kyrgyzstan. Here's my Kyrgyzstan identity card. It has my name on it. I've transliterated it from the Cyrillic for you. Are they going to have the technology, have the uh, ability to really verify that? Probably not. I juxtapose this idea of information sparseness with real life. Real life is an information-dense environment. I don't get to choose what I tell you about myself. Yeah, I get to choose some things that I tell you about myself, but I can't tell you that I'm a dog and have you believe me. I can't tell you that I'm an eight-foot-tall Asian woman and have you believe me. Why? You can see me. This is an information-sparse environment. If I break into a building, if I break into a business, if I break into a house, I'm going to leave a trail of breadcrumbs no matter how hard I try even if I don't leave any fingerprints or traces of hair, I'm going to leave a broken doorknob or broken glass. I'm going to leave some evidence behind. No matter how good I am, there's going to be something. Online, we're in an information-sparse environment. You need to figure out what information you want to look for, you want to record, you want to monitor, and hope that the attacker isn't able to figure out what you're doing and either bypass it, delete it, or worse, alter it. And the altering it is one of the scariest things. So one of the things we talk a, a great deal about uh, is cyber conflict, cyber warfare, things like that. Um, uh, if a country were to bomb another country, the bombed country would be able to take proportionate response uh, and retaliate. If I'm launching a cyber attack, or let's uh, I rephrase that, if I experience a cyber attack, if my critical infrastructure is disabled by an online adversary or a uh, power plant uh, a pump is forced into some <coughs> circulation mode that causes physical damage and destroys the power plant, arguably that's an act of war. Do I get to retaliate? Well, I'm probably going to trace that attack back. And where's it going to be coming from? If I'm not careful, it's coming from a hospital. <coughs> Not just a hospital, but it's coming from a hospital in a friendly country, an ally country. The attackers are going to route the attacks through some system of intermediaries, both to hide their identities, to make it harder to find out who they were, but also to prevent me from retaliating, from taking an action against them. Um, makes uh, this entire area that much more complicated. OK, really quick uh, uh, quip. Uh, there are two types of companies, those that have been attacked and those that don't know that they've been attacked. Um, uh, th this, is a, this is terrible. I'm forgetting um, which director of which agency, it was either NSA or Cyber, US Cyber Command, uh, made this uh, comment uh, in congressional testimony a couple years ago. Um, and it captures uh, a great deal of truth. I want to spend a bit of time talking about types of attackers. 
So this chart is uh, from Steve Bellavin, a security and computer science professor at the Columbia University. He talks about attackers and hackers in four categories. Joy hackers are those who have relatively little skill and aren't really that focused in attacks. They just like breaking into systems, seeing what their skills are, causing mischief. Uh, this is your prototypical, uh, and this is not an accurate statement, but it's from uh, the political characterizations. This is uh, your typical 400 pound teenager in his mother's basement uh, who's just messing around with stuff online. Moving to more focus, you have targeted attacks. This is, I don't have much skill, but I want to break into the schools, the university's computers to change my grades. I'm targeting a specific victim. I've got some reason behind what I'm trying to do. Juxtaposed with that, you have high skill, low focus attacks, opportunistic attacks. These are things like ransomware. These are things like data breaches. These are crimes where you have attackers who have a great deal of skill, they know how to break into systems, but they don't care what systems they're breaking into. They have some sophisticated motivation. They're trying to get into Equifax because they know there's a great big pool of data there that they can sell on the black market and make a lot of money. Then the last quadrant you've got that is persistent threats. These are well-funded, generally nation-state actors um, who are targeting valuable assets and have a great deal of skill and resources. So these are your North Koreas trying to break into the US government or Sony. These are your Russias trying to develop uh, not pet yet, some new uh, uh, attack vector for taking down uh, systems in the Ukraine. Most people worry about the wrong thing. Most people worry about joy hackers, targeted attacks, and advanced persistent threats. Nowadays, joy hackers, they aren't really a thing. The, the low uh, hanging fruit for them to play with is mostly gone, and most of these people are getting a uh, uh, um, swept up into more sophisticated, hopefully educational programs. <laughs> targeted attacks, this is a really small subset of attackers. If someone's trying to break into your systems, if someone's targeting you specifically, if they can't, first, if they can't get in through the internet, through cyber means, they're just going to break the window. They're going to try to uh, get at you some other way. Um, more important, most of these individuals uh, if they're really dedicated, they're quickly going to become advanced persistent threats. They're going to be dedicating resources to really trying to compromise your systems. And the reality is if, an, if North Korea comes after you, you don't stand a chance. They're going to get into your systems. It's a question at that point of cat and mouse international politics. Uh, so <coughs> a very different uh, uh, world. Instead, what most people should be worried about are opportunistic attacks. Um, if you put an unpatched, that is a, a freshly installed Windows XP system on the internet, within, I think it's actually less than this, but within five minutes, it will be compromised. It will experience a successful attack that gives remote actors some level of control over the system. The way that these opportunistic attacks work is you scan the internet constantly. You spread worms from one computer to one computer to one computer. You use botnets to take over um, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of devices with known compromises, and it's all done automatically. These attackers are not coming after you. They are coming after your computers, and they don't care who you are, where your computers are, there aren't any borders. This is all done technologically and automatically. These are the systems, these are the attacks that most people, most companies, most entities are going to experience. Uh, so, the system is rotten to the core. I've got some really fancy animation here. That was a line you can't see. I circled powerless going down to the system is rotten to the core. Uh, the, the reality of uh, this ecosystem um, is with no liability, with so much complexity, no one has the incentive to make their system secure because it's always someone else's problem. Um, one of the common mantras of computer security is security is everyone's responsibility. 
Well, when security is everyone's responsibility, what does that mean for me or you or you or any individual actor? Security is no one's responsibility because you know everyone else is taking care of it. And you know if something goes wrong, you can't be shown that was your fault. You can't be shown to be the person who caused this bad problem to occur. And even if you are, is that we're going to stand up in court? It's everyone's responsibility. Um, so when security is everyone's responsibility, you end up in a system where no one is going to be taking responsibility and investing in security. You see systematic underinvestment um, with all of these incentives leading to really wrong, perverse outcomes. Uh, for those who might have some uh, economics uh, background, in law we talk a lot about externalities. Uh, the idea of an externality um, is there could be some uncompensated harm. So if I'm doing, I'm engaging in an activity with someone else and it causes pollution or it causes harm to other people, that's uncompensated, that's an externality. And we're really concerned about externalities when there's no way to identify the cause of them or take legal action against um, the individuals responsible for them. The classic example we use is the factory causing pollution. It's really difficult for homeowners 300 miles away from a factory to figure out where that pollution is coming from and it's a very diffuse uh, a set of harms so you're going to have a collective action problem. So that's an area where we tend to regulate pollution because we're concerned about uh, uh, these externalities. In the security ecosystem, uh, a lot of researchers uh, say that it's characterized by externalities and the term I use is uh, risk externalization. We know bad things are going to happen, but it's always someone else's problem. It can always be said to be someone else's problem. And I'm just trying to have running code so I can get rough consensus around my product. So it's someone else's problem. In that system, it's always going to be someone else's problem and never going to get addressed. So the present and maybe some uh, positive comments about the future. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through these uh, beyond just saying, yeah, things are bad. Um, every year since 2007 has been called by some smart talking head person the year of cybersecurity or the year of data breach because every year since 2007 things have just seemed to get worse and worse. Um, 2017 did not disappoint. We'll see how uh, 2018 lives up. Uh, we've got denial of service attacks, infrastructure attacks, the whole Internet of Things is one of the scariest things uh, that I work on. Uh, online stalking, harassment, and abuse are prolific. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen a really alarming rise in uh, use of uh, Internet uh, advertising uh, uh, websites and message boards for sex trafficking, and of course, information warfare after the 26, um, 2016 election is uh, one of the uh, constant things people are discussing. So should we be worried? Yes, for all the reasons above. <laughs> should we, we be worried? I'm not so sure. No, I'm going to say uh, perhaps. Um, what we're seeing is a change in the world. What we're seeing is a transition to a borderless world. One of the uh, current trends in the technology is the reestablishment of some borders. But this is a more complicated world. A lot more is possible than was possible 25, 30 years ago. And a lot of that stuff is really, really good. A lot of it is scary. A lot of it's challenging. We've got new problems to overcome. One of the biggest problems is that we need to work with international uh, peers. We need to work on an international level to address many of these problems. One of the most concerning things over the last couple of years is this information warfare idea. A lot of discussion about cyber attacks and are these acts of war. The law of armed conflict, the law of war, is one of the greatest achievements of humankind. The purpose of the law of war, the law of armed conflict, is to say, this is not war. This really bad thing that another country did, as an international community, 
unless it is so incredibly egregious, we are going to do whatever we can to say, this is not an act of war because we don't want war. We do not want retaliation. We don't want what Russia is doing to be war. Instead, we want it to be criminal mischief, misconduct. We want it to be handled through diplomatic means, not through retaliation. And the reality, everything that Russia does, we do too. And the UK does, and France does, and Germany does. This is the way that international politics works. We try to scare them as much as they try to scare us because it gives them advantage. And it's the game that we play at the international level. And I'll end by saying the law, the technology, and above all, society is figuring this stuff out. We're starting to make sense of it. It might not be for another 5, 10, 15 years until we reach a new equilibrium, find a new place where uh, we start to feel comfortable. But that's the nature of things. That's the nature of growth and advancement and uh, really increasing in the power of our society. The internet has done incredible things and given us incredible new t tools and capabilities and made the world a much smaller, in many ways, more interesting place. And there are growing pains that come with that. If you look at what's going on in Congress right now, there's discussion about reigning in a lot of this uh, uh, non-liability, this immunity, finding ways to hold internet companies responsible. The internet companies are investing billions of dollars to try and improve things. And I bet that most Americans today are a lot more skeptical and nuanced in how they're consuming information that they get online than they were two years ago. And these are all good things. And on that note, thank you. about 15 minutes uh, for refreshments and we have a Q&A, come back and see flashlights so you can be able to judge when to come back. Thank you.